It's a common feature of our modern lives to go get a haircut on a regular basis to keep up with the latest fashion trends, to appear presentable in front of our peers, or at the very least, to make going about the day just a bit easier. This routine has been going on for thousands of years and is something that often crosses my mind while awkwardly avoiding small talk at the barbershop. Today we'll be taking a look at what it was like to get your haircut in ancient Rome. A quick thanks to Harry's for sponsoring this video. When the Romans explored this very subject, they believed that their ancestors simply went without them. The scholar Marcus Terentius Vero, for instance, suggests that because the statues of the men of old usually all had long hair and long beards, they must not have had barbers. Archaeological evidence, however, does indicate that people in this earlier period definitely had access to things like combs and shears. But there is likely some truth to the idea that a widespread, professional class of hair cutters just hadn't developed yet. However, Marcus Terentius Vero does give us an idea of when this might have taken place. He states that around the year 300 BC, a Roman by the name of Publius Titinius Menas first brought a barber in from Sicily. This makes sense since at the time Rome was but a small regional player eager to import military and cultural ideas from its neighbors. Over time, this would shape the traditions of the burgeoning new power. So what were Roman hairstyles like? Well, if you look at the statues, reliefs, frescoes, and other art depicting ancient Romans, you are met with a bewildering amount of diversity when it comes to hairdos. At times women might prefer simple or ornate coiffures, while men might sport a beard with a messy top or appear clean shaven with neat curls. Let's now quickly cover these trends before getting on to the barbers and their shops. For starters, it must be said that the adoption of Hellenistic trends had a great deal of influence on Roman customs. This is generally seen by the increasing societal practice of men wearing their hair short and shaving regularly. Pliny the Elder would have us believe that Scipio the Younger of the 2nd century BC was the first to shave every day. In his footsteps would follow the other elite who sought to set themselves apart from the poorer classes. From this developed all sorts of cultural ideas. Being unkempt and unshaven was generally frowned upon. Thus the act of shaving became important. One of the rites of passage growing up as a Roman boy was to have your first shave and to consecrate the hairs to the gods. This might also be done by sailors who clipped their hair and even their eyebrows to make offerings to Castor and Pollux before a journey. However, one might choose to forgo shaving to make a statement. For instance, it was a common way to express mourning such as during a judicial conviction or a funeral. Many generals are even reported to have refused to shave after suffering a defeat, vowing only to cut their hair upon restoration of their honor. Yet others, like philosophers, intentionally flouted social norms to set themselves apart. Later on, during the imperial period, trends would change. Emperor Hadrian, for instance, appears to have been the first to wear a full beard, apparently tied scars which in turn set the fashion of wearing beards again, which lasted at least until the time of Constantine. As for the top of the head, men might wear their hair in a variety of ways. More often than not, it was simply just cut short and kept straight. Sometimes though, they'd have a little bit of waves going on, or even some curling, as was the trend for many who sought to emulate the perception of Alexander the Great. More elaborate looks were possible with the use of wigs to appear even fancier, or to cover up a receding hairline. When it came to women, well, there's a ton that could be said here, but we'll have to reserve a deep dive for a video of its own. Suffice to say that women's fashion changed just as much as today, and could take on an incredible amount of variety. If you'd like to see some of this in action, I can recommend the channel Janet Steffens, which even offers tutorials on how to achieve different looks. The basic trend though seems to have been that early on, women were relatively modest, as was the custom in Greece. In fact, elite women in Greece were actually expected to wear full or at least partial veils whilst in public. As with the men, these practices were carried over in some capacity to Rome. But inevitably, as wealth was accumulated, elite women were keen to flaunt it. This often meant the adoption of increasingly ornate, visible, and time-consuming designs which peaked around the Flavian period. As with unshaved men, women who left their hair down were seen with less repute. Though again, I'll have to point out that this might have been done intentionally as a sign of modesty or mourning. So now with that covered, let's talk about who would be the ones to bring these styles to life. 
Well, for starters, it was generally the practice that this would be done by someone other than yourself. So these would have been barbers. Male barbers for men, female barbers for women. And these barbers would have had a variety of tools at their disposal. For the purposes of our discussion, we're going to be comparing and contrasting different shaving kits from different time periods, a modern versus a Roman one. And luckily for this demonstration, Harry's actually did send me one of their holiday kits, which includes the following. It's going to be a nice five-bladed razor. It comes with a cover to protect the blade and the head itself. It comes with additional detachable blades and heads, and then also shaving gel. And this is all the sort of elegant modern equipment that the Romans would have definitely been envious of. So take, for instance, this razor from Harry's. If we go ahead and take a look at it, it actually has five blades. That's even more than the, you know, standard three that you'd see. And the advantage of five blades is that actually, if you look at it, you know, close and you're going to be passing it over your face or rest of your body, it actually makes sure that the skin stays smooth so that when you cut, you can get really close without actually, you know, nipping a bit of your skin. Uh, and that would not have been the case back in the day of the Romans, as opposed to this, you know, three or five in the case of Harry's. Um, it's just a single blade, and so what you're relying on is really the skill and the dexterity of your Roman uh, barber. And that starts to be a little bit tough. Apparently things that they would do when they were at the barber shop was, if you're the person getting shaved, you would have to, you know, puff up your cheeks and try and make your skin as taut as possible. You can imagine them, you know, pulling and, and manipulating your face, all of that making it very tough in the past. Whereas, you know, with the modern shaving kit and the Harry's uh, razor, it's the five blades, which is beneficial. It also has the built-in, you know, uh, first row that provides a little bit of gel. And then in addition, you have, you know, the flex head and all that stuff that makes it much, much easier for the individual to do the care uh, that you'd want for your face or whatever part of your body you're shaving. Now, it's not just going to be the features inherent in modern razor blades. But actually, it's going to be the overall quality of the material itself. So if you look, for instance, at this one, this is going to be something manufactured in Germany by Harry's. It has good quality, it's durable, it'll last you a long time. And uh, that's to be contrasted with the Roman blades. Again, single blades. These would have been manufactured in small shops or studios within the city, perhaps down the block, perhaps even by the barber themselves. And yes, they might have taken pride in their craft, but these things were notorious for getting dull at the end of a long workday and inevitably that'll lead to some cuts and scrapes and an uneven shave, which is again to be contrasted with the modern, you know, for example, Harry's shaving set. Another modern advantage that we have is going to be shaving gel. Now one of the advantages of shaving gel primarily is going to be that it helps lubricate your skin and your hair. And that's important because when you apply it and then you come in with that razor blade, it allows you to get real close and you can remove hair without getting that friction, without getting that tug. And also one of the important things is it provides a protective layer that lies right on your skin so that when you're getting that close shave, you're not actually going to be able to cut yourself as easily. That's not going to be the case back in the day of the Romans. They had to rely on more primitive means, namely, you know, coming in with a damp cloth and applying that to get a little bit of, of hydration, uh, perhaps even taking a brush or something else to apply some oil. So they would have had to rely on something like that. But inevitably, it meant that the process of removing hair with an old Roman blade was somewhat tough. So that's why they had other ways to remove hair. This might involve plucking with tweezers. They might actually use a rough pumice stone to try and, you know, use the abrasiveness of it to get that hair off. They might have actually used a hot metal rod or something to try and burn or singe the hair off. And finally, they even had these uh, chemical concoctions that they would apply to your body that would make the hair fall off of your body. And all of this in pursuit of the latest fashion trends. Now before we move on and talk about what it was like to walk into and experience the Roman Barbershop, I did want to give a final plug and thank you to Harry's for sending this demo kit over. Again, this is going to be their holiday bundle kit. It's on a limited time offer. And if you go down into the link below for harrys.com slash Invicta, you actually get $5 off plus free shipping. Uh, I do recommend this product. Again, the five blades plus the rest of the kit makes it very easy to shave. This makes an awesome gift for members of your family. It's quick, it's easy, it's simple, it comes in a handsome bundle, so again, I can recommend it. The product itself, like I said, is great, but what's better is refills are cheap. Harry's does allow you to make it very easy to refund if you don't enjoy the product. And so go ahead and you know use the discount that I relayed to you for this holiday gift, or if you wanna use it for yourself, what you can actually do is go to the website, redeem the gift, and get $3 that goes towards whatever product you want before actually committing. So that is gonna be it. I hope you guys enjoyed, and let's go ahead and talk about what it was like to actually head on into that barbershop. 
For your average Roman, they would likely have just gone down to their local barber shop, the Tonstrina, to get their shave, haircut, and even nails clipped. These shops would be located throughout major cities, and ranged from the ramshackle streetside station to the ornate Barber's Guildhouse. They were popular destinations around which people congregated, and it was not uncommon to see long lines waiting to get in. Naturally, in these sorts of situations, people would socialize, and barber shops served as a place, just as today, for all forms of gossip. Once inside, a customer would be attended to by a barber or tonsor. Perhaps, some apprentices might be watching from nearby, or even practicing with their own blunted instruments. The customer would then be seated on a small, low stool. Next, the barber would bring out a long cloth which was draped over the body and ask, how do you want it? If the reply was something like, the same but shorter, the barber would use a comb and shears to clip little bits at a time. If they wanted to chop off a large bit, the barber might simply use their hand as the measure. For the ladies, there would likely be a lot more care and attention paid to styling the hair. Pins, threads, curlers, and all sorts of tools would be used to achieve the most fashionable look. Alternatively, if a person were suffering from certain diseases, the doctor might actually recommend the opposite of fashion, baldness. However, this would be a thin line to tread, as baldness itself was considered a terrible disease, and the Romans tried their best to figure out ways to fix it. Pliny, for instance, offers a crazy solution by suggesting that one should promote growth through the application of ashes from burnt dung mixed with oil of myrtle. Others suggest the blood of flies, hedgehog remains, raven eggs, cabbage, or women's milk. This shows the absurd lengths to which they went to combat the scourge of baldness as they saw it. Check out the channel Voices of the Past for more quotes on this topic. Once the top of the head had been dealt with, the barber would then turn to the removal of facial hair. As we mentioned, this would involve a razor, tweezers, pumice stone, hot metal, waxing, or chemicals. A knife might also be procured to trim one's nails. If blood were drawn at any point, this would have to be attended to. Pliny suggests cobwebs as an excellent band-aid. Throughout this process, it would be the habit of barbers to make small talk about all sorts of rumors which had passed through their shop that day. This was not always to the delight of the customers. According to one record, when a sassy barber asked the customer, What can I do for you today, your majesty? The client replied, Silence would be nice. <laughs> I can totally relate there. Uh, finally, with their work complete, the barber would bring you a mirror to inspect their work. I'm sure, then as now, many Romans felt pressure to say, it's great, through gritted teeth. Now let's take a look at some specific anecdotes about the haircuts for different social classes. At the lowest rungs of society, well, individuals really wouldn't be able to afford a professional barber. Perhaps they would have done the cutting themselves to present an air of respectability or to reduce the risk of lice. But it wouldn't be uncommon to run into some plebeian on the streets with a big old beard. The poet Marshall has a great piece of writing about this. It's winter, and harsh December stiffens. Yet you, Linus, dare to hold up everyone you meet in Rome, whether they come from here or there, with your snowy kiss. What are you able to do that would be more hurtful and cruel if you had been stabbed and flogged? In this cold, I would not have my wife kiss me, or my innocent daughter with her coarse lips. But you are sweeter and more elegant, with a discoloured icicle hanging from your canine nostrils and a beard as stiff as a Cilician barber with upturned shears cuts from a Senefian husband. I fear less to fall in with a hundred tongues fresh from action. So if you have any sense and shame, Please hold off your winter kissing, Linus, until April. Among the more well-to-do, you'd be able to visit a barbershop quite regularly. If you were wealthy enough, you'd actually be able to have them come to you. In this case, word of mouth was quite important for finding out which barber to trust. A particularly bad review given to us by Marshall warns of Antiochus the barber, who would strip horses bare to their manes would have Prometheus begging for the torturer bird instead, and would leave you looking like you'd been attacked by an angry woman with long nails. Skilled barbers, on the other hand, could develop quite the lucrative network of clients. 
Ammianus Marcellinus quotes a barber who claims he made enough every day to feed 20 people and as many horses with a heavy annual salary alongside many perks. It's due to these sometimes exorbitant costs that the wealthy would instead turn to skilled slaves for their needs. Now finally, let's turn to the top of the social ladder with a few anecdotes about the emperor. As one would imagine, they had quite the treatment. Here's a quote about Augustus from the historian Suetonius. He was unusually handsome and exceedingly graceful at all points of his life, although he cared nothing for personal adornment. He was so far from being particular about the dressing of his hair that he would have several barbers working in a hurry at the same time. And as for his beard, he now had it clipped and now shaved, while at the very same time he would either be reading or writing something. Obvious flattery aside, it gives a small idea of how the imperial household handled the appearance of the emperor, with extreme care and precision as well as speed. This apparently was Augustus's manner on all but the most disastrous of occasions. Say for instance, after Tudorburg, for example. They say that he was so greatly affected that for several months in succession he cut neither his beard nor his hair, and sometimes he would dash his head against a door, crying, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Considering this was near the end of his life, you can only imagine a wild-haired old man furiously spurning his servants, battering his head against the doors. But other emperors also show specific quirks, such as Nero apparently putting his first beard hairs into a small golden box and offering them to Jupiter, and Caligula apparently roaming the halls with an unshaven face and untrimmed hair after his sister had died. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of ancient Roman hairstyles and haircuts. Now, you've got some great conversation starters for the next time you're trying to make that awkward conversation with your barber, or at least it's information to mull over while you ignore them. A big thanks again to Harry's for sponsoring this video, and Voices of the Past for providing some narration for the quotes. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content like this, and let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see next.